Hello and welcome. It's 10 a.m. on Tuesday, the 17th of February. You're tuned in to our mid morning newscast here on Arirang TV. It's great to have you with us on this rather wintry morning here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom. Let's take a look at what's making headlines. President Park Geun-hye is expected to carry out a small shake-up of the cabinet and her top office today after lawmakers approved Lee Wan Gu as Korea's next prime minister on Monday. Korea and Japan say they have no plans to renew their 14-year-old currency swap deal amid a breakdown in bilateral relations. The 10 billion US dollar agreement will expire next Monday. Plus, Egypt's Air Force bombs Islamic State targets inside Libya a day after a video shows the beheading of 21 Egyptians in the North African country. Our top story this morning, after several months and a handful of nominees, Korea finally has a new prime minister. Lee Wang Gu was confirmed on Monday despite some intense political wrangling over whether he was suitable for the job. Topping off what will be a busy few days, President Park is expected to announce a small cabinet reshuffle today based on E's recommendations. Lee ji reports. Newly elected Prime Minister Lee Wang Gu now holds the country's second highest position. With him in place, President Park Geun-hye can focus on carrying out a cabinet reshuffle and move forward with her policies aimed at economic revitalization and helping the working people. However, the main opposition party and the public speculate that he may become a vegetative prime minister, as many see him as unqualified for the job. Since his confirmation hearing last week, he has been under intense fire for allegations of ethical lapses, including real estate speculation and draft dodging. Although he passed a parliamentary confirmation vote through overwhelming support from his ruling party members, he now bears some heavy responsibilities relating to state affairs. Prime Minister Yi will be tasked with reforming the pension system for civil servants, rooting out corruption among public officials, and restructuring the labor market. Once the presidential office carries out a small reshuffle based on his recommendations, Yi will have to show his strength to control and lead the cabinet. The new prime minister will also have to foster an atmosphere where the presidential office, the National Assembly and the government can better communicate with one another to coordinate policies. Prime Minister Yi has said he would do his part in maintaining cooperation between all governmental parties and, in particular, uphold relations with the main opposition in order to create bipartisanship to push forward with state affairs. Lee Jun, Arirang News. Now, Lee Wan Gu's first full day as Prime Minister will have a strong focus on boosting public safety. First things first, though, as he is scheduled to meet President Park Geun-hye this morning to receive his official letter of appointment. He will then be inaugurated at 2 p.m. this afternoon. Lee's first schedule as Prime Minister will take him to the Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasures Headquarters and the National Police Agency, where he will urge officials to enhance national safety and root out corruption. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe says his government will draw up legislation on collective self-defense that will allow Japan to respond seamlessly to various emergency situations overseas. Now, if this legislation is passed, Japan will be able to dispatch troops overseas in certain limited circumstances, giving an example of when Japan could exercise the right to this so-called collective self-defense. Abe talked about a hypothetical situation in which a U.S. warship carrying Japanese came under attack. Abe also emphasized the new realities of today's world and vowed that Japan would do more to bring peace and stability to the Asia-Pacific region and the world. Now, Korea and Japan say they have no plans to renew their 14-year-old currency swap deal amid a breakdown in bilateral relations. Korea's finance ministry announced on Monday that the last outstanding currency swap deal between Seoul and Tokyo worth $10 billion will expire next Monday scheduled and that they have made no further arrangements for a future deal. This was widely expected as diplomatic relations between the two countries have cooled over Japan's territorial claims to Korea's Dokdo Island. In addition, Korea's need for the extra cushion provided by the deal has decreased as it has abundant foreign reserves backed up by a strong current account surplus. And we have some news just coming in that Korea's central bank has left its key interest rate 
unchanged at 2% this month. This follows two rate cuts, each by a quarter of a percentage point uh, in the second half of last year. We'll bring you a report on this in our next newscast at noon Korea time. Now, Egypt has opened up another front in the global fight against the Islamic State militant group launching airstrikes on IS targets in Libya. The strikes followed the videotaped mass murder of more than 20 Egyptian Christians on a Libyan beach. Cairo is demanding the world join it in destroying the extremist group's operations in Libya. Our Kim Yambin reports. Anger erupted in Egypt one day after the Islamic State militant group released a gruesome video showing the beheading of 21 Egyptian Christians. That rage rained down on IS control areas in Libya, where the decapitations are believed to have taken place. Egyptian state television aired footage of fighter jets departing a hangar. The words long live Egypt can be seen written on a jet's tail as it sets off on its mission. This was followed by night vision aerial footage showing airstrikes destroying reported IS camps, training sites and weapons storage areas. Of course, what happened is a barbaric and savage terrorist act that goes back to the Stone Age. I can't imagine who would do that. Egypt has every right to defend itself, and it must take steps against this type of terrorism carried out by those fundamentalists. While the bombings were taking place, some of the victims' families held a funeral service for their loved ones in El Or village of Samalut, though their bodies presumably remain in Libya. Egypt's President Abdel Fattah Assisi is calling on the international community to expand its fight against the IS group, beyond its strongholds in Iraq and Syria, to include Libya. He says the situation in Libya is a clear threat to world peace and security. The UN Security Council and Secretary General Ban Ki-moon condemned the mass murder as heinous and cowardly. Pope Francis, in his Monday address, urged Catholics to remember their brothers who died for the mere fact of confessing Christ. Kim Hyun-bin. I need that news. A meeting of Eurozone finance ministers to uh, work out Greece's bailout program has been abruptly cut short as the debt program is due to expire in less than two weeks' time. For more, we join Eunice Kim at the News Centre. So, Eunice, we are basically counting down now. Uh, Greece's European creditors have issued an ultimatum. Extend the programme or bust. Yeah, that's right, Mark. Extend the program by the deadline of Friday this week, or Greece could risk facing bankruptcy and a potential exit from the Eurozone as it's left to solve its problems on its own. But Greece is sticking to its anti-austerity promises. Here are some of what they said coming out of the meeting just hours ago. The uh, Eurogroup ministers were unanimous on this point. It really is up to the Greek government now to decide whether they want an extension of the program. Within that program, a lot of changes are possible. There is flexibility, but the main features of the program, keeping the budget on track, reforming the economy, have to be maintained. Uh, but the first step would be an extension, and then the second step is let's talk about the content of the program, but not the other way around. We want an honorable settlement. We want to wed together these principles, the principle that there is a program that has to be respected and the principle that there is a government that challenges the, the logic of this pro program and let's find common ground between the two. This is what we've been saying from the beginning. It's not a bluff because it's the only option we have. It's plan A. There is no plan B. And though there wasn't a whole lot of optimism going into this meeting, the meeting of 19 finance ministers of the Eurozone basically broke down within three hours of starting. Greece and its creditors reiterated where they stood on the issue. Finance Minister Varoufakis calling a proposal to extend the current bailout package by six months absurd. Now, despite the circumstances, Varoufakis still said he was certain Europe would come around in the next 48 hours to find phrasing that works for everyone. Experts have said a Grexit would be devastating not only for Greece, but for the Eurozone as a whole. Well, I guess no one really knows what's going to happen until 
uh, Greece decides to leave the Eurozone or not. But let's check in with uh, Denmark. The country is still in mourning after its capital uh, was hit by twin attacks over the weekend at a free speech uh, gathering and then outside a synagogue as well. And we're learning more about the, the late uh, young gunman, of course, was killed by security forces as well. Yeah, ironically, the man behind Denmark's first terror attack was one of their own, a 22-year-old born and raised in Denmark who had a long rap sheet, but officials say it likely was not part of a larger terror cell. Monday evening, tens of thousands of people came together at vigils across Copenhagen to mourn the victims of the weekend's twin attacks. Local media estimate more than 40,000 people took part. Flowers were laid and candles lit in the colors of the country, proud of its openness and safety record. You're hearing from Denmark's prime minister there. She pledged to remain strong and not be intimidated by extremist attacks to free speech and other liberties. Local media have identified the gunman as Omar El Hussein, who authorities believe may have been radicalized while he was in prison recently. He was released about two weeks weeks ago. Reports also said the 22-year-old pledged allegiance to the Islamic State group on his Facebook page, Mark. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, Eunice, for the international news updates, and we'll see you back at noon. See you then. Now, on a much lighter note, the three-day-long Lunar New Year holiday begins on Wednesday, tomorrow. Most Koreans will be exchanging gifts with their family and friends, meaning it's one of the busiest times of the year for the nation's very hard-working delivery workers. Now, Shin Semin reports. Tis the season. It's that time of year again when the postal service in Korea gets flooded with packages filled with items like fresh fruit, meat, health products and other popular seasonal gifts. They will be shipped to cities and towns across the country ahead of Lunar New Year's Day. Piles of packages. Over 500,000 parcels are being checked in and out of this distribution center every day, at least during this time of the year. The amount? Nearly double the usual, forcing the Postal Service to expand its manpower by 10% for the holiday rush. While there is definitely gratitude owed to the senders of these items, the backbreaking work of local postal and delivery service people should not be forgotten. Lee chung -hee has been delivering some 300 boxes a day, trying to keep up with the rush of packages. His days have gotten longer and his nights of rest much shorter. I don't really look forward to the holidays. I used to like them, but being in this profession has changed my perspective. Now, I personally hand deliver gifts to my relatives. Despite the drawbacks, Lee still gives 110 percent to his work. It's a little nerve-wracking. I have to be careful that I don't lose or mishandle any of the packages, especially because I know they're gift boxes. And thanks to Lee and others like him in the delivery service, hundreds of thousands of people across the country will be able to share and enjoy an even happier holiday this year. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Now, the rapid increase in the number of Chinese tourists to Korea has the nation's travel industry jumping for joy. This year promises to be the best year yet, especially during the uh, upcoming Lunar New Year holiday, which is forecast, in fact, to see a record number of Chinese coming to Korea. But there are serious concerns. This trend might burn out pretty fast, especially if the quality of tourism services continues to leave some Chinese visitors feeling rather cold. Al Gonsua reports. It's that time of the year again, when a single country's visitors to Korea bring about happy smiles to the nation's economy. It's Chinese tourists who are flocking in again for this Lunar New Year's holiday season, the biggest in China, beginning on Wednesday. 
This year's number of visitors to Korea during the one-week period is expected to reach around 120,000, a 30 percent fall jump from last year. Visits are on a steady rise, with a total of 7.2 million Chinese expected to come over this year. It's welcoming news for the sluggish domestic economy, as shopping tops the to-do list for the average Chinese tourist. I bought a lot of cosmetics, shoes and clothes. Experts say this year looks especially promising. Chinese tourists are estimated to bring Korea around 180 million U.S. dollars from direct consumption just during the Chinese New Year holiday season, and that figure will probably top 630 million dollars for all of February. But not everyone is satisfied with everything they experience on their trip. I had no problems with communication or accommodations, but I did have problems trying to receive after service for something I bought here last year. A recent study shows that Chinese tourists complained the most about having troubles with communicating during their visit. Second and third on the list were unsatisfactory food and high costs. This is why experts say there needs to be a bigger focus on high-quality tourism rather than quantity so that the Chinese visitors do not call their trips to Korea a one-time experience. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. And the vast majority of those Chinese tourists to Korea will be coming via Incheon International Airport. And the airport is celebrating a record 10th consecutive year as the best airport in the world for service. The airport's Council International gave Incheon a near-perfect score of 4.97 points out of 5. It also came top of the pile in other categories. It was named the top Asia-Pacific airport as well as the top big-sized airport. Incheon International Airport was included in that category for the very first time as it reached the 40 million passenger mark in 2013. 1,800 airports took part in this survey. Now, Korea's southern port city of Busan has blossomed into one of the country's best culture and tourism hubs over the years, but some of the city are saying the shine is starting to come off. Uh, Ji Myung Gil sat down with a lawmaker from the city to find out what Busan needs to do to keep pushing forward. Busan, probably known for its annual film festival and the G-Star Global Game Exhibition, is striving to become a global city. What more does it need to do and what other investments need to be made in order to make it a competitive global city? I believe Busan can gain competitiveness on the global stage by expanding the convention industry and revitalizing the economy of the western part of Busan, which is lagging behind in development compared to the eastern part of the city. Busan wants to build a new airport and is currently bidding for the 2028 Summer Olympics, which is all part of the future vision for the city. All of these projects will require a significant investment. What do you think about the values of all the projects in relation to the size of the investment? Focusing on external development is important with the Olympics, as you mentioned. But I believe working toward internal stability is also important. Busan is facing problems such as elderly poverty and increasing suicide rates, both of which are far above the national average. There need to be policies that can help boost quality of life for the citizens of Busan. In fact, all these problems could apply to other cities in Korea, too. How do we move away from metropolitan development and toward balanced regional development? Busan is barely keeping its title as Korea's second largest metropolis after Seoul. Cities like Busan need to encourage balanced regional development to ensure national competitiveness. National policies should be oriented towards helping people who live in provincial cities to establish a firm footing in their hometowns. As a member of the Parliamentary Committee for Education, Culture, Sports and Tourism, what are you hoping to achieve 
this year. In order to keep Busan from slipping into decline, I think we need to make education the top priority. Many of Busan's young students are leaving to go to universities in Seoul because they feel a gap in educational opportunities. I think my duty is to narrow the gap with the capital region. Thank you, lawmaker, for speaking with us today. And a good Tuesday morning to you all as we kick things off with the Korean national football team, where after confirming their March A match schedule, they've announced the venues for the two matches against Uzbekistan and New Zealand on Monday. And it seems like both matches will take place here in the nation, as the March 27th match against Uzbekistan will take place at the Daejeon World Cup Stadium, marking it the first time in nearly 10 years that an A match takes place in the same venue Korea defeated Italy during the 2002 Korea-Japan World Cup. And on March 31st, the match against New Zealand will take place in Seoul at the Seoul World Cup Stadium as the KFA continues to spread the venues all around the nation. Now, when FINA, the world's swimming governing body, gave uh, Park Tae-hwan an extension on the hearing, which was initially set for February 27th, uh, we were all saying finally he caught a break. Well, it seems like shortly after that, hit another bump on the road, this time possibly a career ender. According to reports coming out on Monday, Park tae hwans suspension initially began on September 3, 2014, when he first tested positive on a banned substance. But because he requested for a B sample testing, his suspension might start on the date where he tested positive the second time, meaning December 8, 2014. And with this mandatory provisional suspension being pushed for three months, this means that a 20-month suspension, which he's likely to receive, will not allow him to participate in the 2016 Rio Summer Games and possibly end his career. Now, it seemed like everyone was blaming Lee Sang Hwa's left knee issues for the reason why she's been struggling this season in speed skating, except for her coach Eric Bauman, who's saying that it's not her knee. In an interview after Lee Sang Hwa's fifth place finish at the ISU Single Distance Speed Skating Championships, the national speed skating team head coach Eric Bauman stated that it's not her left knee that's the problem, but fatigue. He added that she's not been able to rest and that along with her knee not being 100% is the reason for why she has been struggling. Now, the former Dutch junior team head coach made it clear that a surgery is not needed, that she'll be soon back in form after a proper rest. Now it seems like number three has been quite a popular number in the sporting world recently, with Son Heung-min scoring three goals this past weekend, and both Lee sang hwa and Mo Tae-bum going after their third straight gold in the 500-meter event. But this time, it's in the LPGA. Now with the ISPS Honda Women's Australian Open taking place starting on Thursday, the Korean LPGA stars hope to make it three straight victories to start off the new season, after Chen Ayun and Kim se young grabbed the first two titles of the season. But historically, the odds are against them as Shin Jie is the only past winner in the history of the event when she won it back in 2013. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs.
Well, it started to snow here in Seoul about an hour ago, and snow keeps falling over in Gangwon-do from yesterday. So be sure to be safe out on the roads. And for those of you plan to travel to eastern parts of the peninsula, again, be extra careful as the 10 centimeters of heavy snowfall could fall during the day, and things will get clearer as we head into the afternoon. Though it should be chillier today, so dress warmly as the temperature readings will. Be a few notches lower than yesterday, so the daytime high here in the capital will rise to five, while Daewoo and Gwangju peak at nine and six, and Busan should top out at 11 this afternoon. And as for the other regions, Jeju Island should see a high of nine, while Daejeon and Tokyo both peak at five. Now, thankfully, the weather should cooperate for Lunar New Year holiday. Readings will remain on the mild side, but we have nationwide rain in the forecast on Saturday afternoon. Which could linger into Sunday morning. Well, that's all for the weather now. Have a wonderful day. Well, thank you very much for the very comprehensive weather update, Jian. And that's all we have for now. Plenty more stories are online, and we'll be back at noon Korea time with our next newscast. So until then, goodbye.